morning. Welcome to Move Ministries. Uh, glad you are here to join us. It is always good to be in the company of the saints and in the Word of God this Wednesday morning. It was sunny, but now it's clouding over. We're going to get some rain here, but we'll start our day. We'll start our day, the foundation of our day, on the Word of God. So that's always a good place to start. So let's just uh, begin in prayer. Good morning, Lord. It is good to be in your presence. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Father, I would just ask humbly, I would request humbly that you would meet with us, Lord, that you personally would speak to us, that you would be our teacher, you would be our guide, you would help us to glean from this scripture that which you want us to take hold of, Lord. By the power of your spirit, lead and guide us into all truth, and by the power of that same spirit transform us that we may be more grow more into the likeness of your son i love my my former pastor pastor sal used to always say only you lord can change a heart and that's what we want is a heart changed and transformed by you amen, amen. <laughs> you can you can hear my dog in the background is uh chasing after very vicious squirrels. So we're hoping to get her kind of under control. Emily just closed the shades there so she can't see. So, okay, we're gonna do the best we can here with a, with a little pup in the background. So last time we were together, we were in chapter 23 of Acts. We are nearing the end of Acts and, and Paul is um, on his way to Rome, much like in the, the end of uh, the book of Luke. Remember when Jesus had set his face like Flint towards Jerusalem? Well, now uh, the Lord is setting Paul like Flint towards uh towards Rome, that he might be a witness in Rome. So chapter 23 begins with really with Paul being smacked by the high priest Ananias. And why is Paul getting smacked around? Well, because he claims to have this uh, good conscience, this clear conscience, this soft conscience is what we really talked about uh, before the God and before men. And what does that mean? Paul wasn't claiming to be sinless, but Paul was claiming that he kept this his his conscience soft, meaning that if if Paul sinned against God or against man, then he was quick to confess it. And that's a really important thing for us as Christians to to keep this soft conscience such that uh, we talk about this in, in our house is that if, if you were to even steal a paper clip, that it would so wreck your conscience that you would have to confess it in, in, in such a in seemingly small manner. Okay, and so Paul stands before the Sanhedrin and it's almost as if this pack of wild dogs is, is about to attack Paul. And remember I said then Paul, that's when Paul throws this bone in front of all of these, these religious figures, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and instead of attacking Paul, they, they go for this bone. And what is the bone? The word that, that he uses, this it's a metaphor uh, for, um, for the resurrection. Paul claims that he is preaching, he's on trial for the resurrection. And why is this so uh, so explosive to these two groups? Is because the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. They do not believe in eternal life, but the Pharisees do. And so it starts this strife and this agitation and this division between these two groups, such that the, the pagan Roman commander feared for the life of Paul, and he removed them, removed Paul and put him into the barracks where Paul would be safe from from these God-fearing Jews. So then I, I love this verse and we just have to, we have to read this verse again from chapter 23, verse 11. It says, this is, this is, this is what, uh, you know, if you ever wonder what causes God to stand, this is what causes God to stand. On the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side, stood at Paul's side and said, take courage for you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. Paul had been a faithful witness in, in Jerusalem. He will be a faithful witness in Rome. This is a promise that we're going to hold on to as we move forward in the book of Acts, that God is going to do exactly what God said he was going to do. If God makes a promise, then he will be faithful to that promise. And so we want to remember, too, that that the resurrection is a essential Christian doctrine. Any group claiming to be a Christian group not preaching the resurrection is a false, this is this is false doctrine, right? The resurrection is essential, is I'm sorry, is essential to our Christian, to our Christian faith. All right, and so Paul leaves uh 
Jerusalem and he is taken down from Jerusalem but going up going north to Caesarea. Caesarea is where the Roman general, uh, I'm sorry, the Roman governor is, um, that's where his uh, central residence is. And so Paul is sent up to Felix for, um, for judgment. And so we're in these chapters as we um, studying these these various trials as Paul stands before the Sanhedrin now he's going to stand before the uh before Felix and and so we want to be reminded that there's there's an element of the gospel message in here that all people will be judged there is a final judgment we're going to talk about that today that that we this is an essential part of the gospel the the judgment to come but we will stand before a judge who is righteous and who is good and who is perfect and though it may not seem like it in this life his judgment will come swiftly and in an instant all right so let's look at uh chapter 24 verse 1. after five days the high priest ananias came down with some elders with an attorney named tertullus and they brought charges charges to the governor against paul okay and so here's essentially what happens is the jews lawyer up all right they he, they bring a lawyer they bring the elders they bring um the high priest and all of these religious officials before felix and so let's talk just a little bit about felix so we understand who he was as a historical character Felix was a former slave, and I think that's always interesting um, when uh, someone who, who is a slave and then is freed and then seeks to enslave others. Felix was known historically as a cruel, evil, vicious uh, ruler. He would um, eventually be uh, removed from his position, actually about two years later, we'll see that in, in the scriptures. Two years later, he was removed from this position because the Jews went to Rome to complain about his leadership because he was so cruel to the Jews. And so as a as a former slave, now, you know, it, it's almost like the the abused become then the abuser. That's that's really who Felix eventually became, as he was just very a very cruel, cruel leader. And we will see too at the end that he was married to a woman named Drusilla. And why? What's what's so interesting about her is that she was a Jew, but also she was the daughter of Herod Agrippa the first. I'm just going to jog your memory as to who he was. Remember way back to chapter 12 in the book of Acts. That was our chapter where we had those three E's where James was executed by Herod Agrippa. He was, um, and then that's when uh, Herod Agrippa put Peter into prison and Peter escaped. And then Herod Agrippa was eventually eaten by worms. So that's his daughter is Drusilla. Drusilla would eventually be killed um, in the explosion at uh, um, Vesuvius, her and her son. And so that's who she is. That's who he's married to. She was actually married to someone else and Felix wooed her away because he had no sense of righteousness and no sense of self-control and so he wooed her away and and he went on to to marry her and so that's just historically who he is all right so let's move on to verses two through four after paul had been summoned tertullus began to accuse him saying to the governor this is felix since we have through you attained much peace and since by your providence reforms are being carried out for this nation we acknowledge this in every way and everywhere, most excellent Felix, with all thankfulness. But that I may not weary you any further, essentially what that means is, I don't want to bore you with the details, but I beg you to grant us by your kindness a brief hearing. Okay, so like no offense to the lawyers out there. I know there are good and godly lawyers, but doesn't this sound like, this sounds like your typical lawyer right he is like laying it on thick he is putting all his hope and trust in the government and in the government's ability to deliver justice all right so that's that's what we see um and so he is he is attempting to to flatter him and and i want us to just take note of that in contrast to to what paul how paul is going to to approach this all right so moving on so now he's sort of buttered up felix this this evil wicked man Verse 5, for we have found this man a real pest and a fellow who stirs up dissension among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazareans. And he even tried to desecrate the temple and then we arrested him. 
We wanted to judge him according to our own law, but Lysias, the commander, came along with much violence, took him out of our hands, mm -hmm. ordering his accusers to come before you. By examining him, him <clears throat> yourself concerning all these matters, you'll be able to ascertain the things of which we accuse him. The Jews also then joined in the attack and asserting that these things were so. All right, so let's just take a look at the charges that, that he brings before the governor. So the first one is, is that this man is a real pest. So even right there, the way that he refers to Paul as this man, it's just a, it's just a form of disrespect. And so when he says this man is a real pest, think of like a fly that is like buzzing around your head and you just keep swatting it away. And it's just annoying. Like Paul has just really become a thorn in their side. He's just an irritation. Okay. So that's the first charge. The next one is that he stirs up dissension among all the Jews throughout the world. He's a divider. He he comes in and he's just disturbing the peace. Well, that immediately, remember how we've talked about how Rome keeps the peace, is basically they just squash anyone who disturbs the peace. And so they're accusing him of, of causing trouble within the Roman Empire, right? And also as a ringleader of a, of a sect, that's a cult. So a cult is anything that... Um, strays from the foundational teaching of a religion. So they're they're accusing him of being the leader of a sect of the Nazareans. So even to say the Nazareans, because Nazarenes, Nazareans were not highly looked upon people. And so to to even say that is is a way of just really putting Paul and at the bottom of the barrel in terms of um you know just totally disrespecting Paul, totally disrespecting uh, you know, everything that Paul, Paul stood for. And so I think it's interesting because like, let's just take a minute to consider Paul. So we have, let's just consider the whole scene, right? We have Felix, this high government official in Herod's Praetorium. This is a, a beautiful, uh, setting. We have all of these religious, uh, figures by this point, the high priest would have all his high priestly garb on. He would have been dressed very impressively. We have this lawyer who would have been dressed impressively. And then we have Paul and they're accusing Paul of turning the world upside down, right? You are, you are just, you are destroying the Roman empire with your teaching. All right. So there's some extra biblical writings that that teach about what Paul looked like, whether those were true or not. I don't really know. They say, you know, Paul was short. He was bald. Um, this always cracks me up. They say that his his eyebrow met in the middle. We would say that uh, Paul had a unibrow. Like there was. Here, here's what Scripture says about Paul, though. Like let, let's like just deal with facts, right? It says in Second Corinthians ten ten. This is what it says about Paul. His letters are weighty and strong but his appearance is unimpressive. So at best, Paul was unimpressive to look at. I love, so Isaiah 53, I consider that the first gospel. Isaiah 53 says this about our savior, that there was no form or majesty, nor appearance that we should take notice of him. There was nothing in the savior. He was not on People Magazine. Right? He was, there was nothing about him that we should be attracted to him or attracted to his appearance. We almost see that in this description of Paul, right? There was nothing impressive about him. There was nothing stately about him. And remember too, Paul has been guided by the Holy Spirit walking around uh, Rome for the past 20 years. He's been stoned. He's been beaten. He has been, you know, probably not very well provided for. He's been working hard. That takes a toll on the body, right? Paul is, is, is going to stand before these people in great contrast. And they are accusing him of doing some, some very divisive things. Now, I want to jog your memory too. Think back to Acts chapter 17, when Paul and, uh, and, and, and his team of believers came into Thessalonica and the Jews started this uproar and they say uh, to the city authorities, they start shouting, these men who have upset the world have come here also. How is this possible? How is it possible that these men who had none of the resources of the world but we're able to upset the world. Think about the things that we use in our churches to try to draw people in, right? I've been to churches with 
strobe lights with smoke and you know all sorts of impressive programs and you walk into the children's program and you think that you're walking into like a mcdonald's playland okay paul had none of those things what did paul have what did paul have paul had the word and paul had the holy spirit giving power to his message this is what turns the world upside down correction this is what turns the world right side up is the word i was having this conversation with a friend just the other day because there's a um one of the largest evangelical churches in in our area the last few years have gone through some just terribly upsetting things in terms of witnessing to the church there's been you know lying and adultery and and, and all sorts of really terrible things and yet they continue to persist in in programming and and offering all of these great things when in reality i'm thinking you know if you really want to see god do a work in this church you would strip away everything but the word of god you would take everything away and you would say this is what i have to offer this is all that we're going to stand on all right and so if your church i'm not saying those programs and all of those things really have no morality right but they are distractions from this word you stray from this word and you're sunk that's what i'm saying paul stood on the word of god and it radically changed things it radically upset the word paul believed in the sufficiency of the scripture and the power of the scripture and it turned the world upside down all right now i'm going to read a big chunk we're going to read paul's response to this so try to focus in try to hone in on on all of these verses we're going to go 10 through 21 and then um and then we're going to we're going to dissect it but i want you to really pay attention to the contrast of how paul approaches this versus um the high-ranking religious officials verse 10 when the governor had nodded for him to speak paul responded knowing that for many years you have been a judge to this nation i cheerfully make my defense since you can take note of the fact that no, this is a fact, facts are friendly, that no more than, than, than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Verse 12, neither in the temple, nor in the synagogue, nor in the city itself, did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot, nor can they prove to you the charges of which they now accuse me. But this I admit to you, that according to the way, remember it's not a way, the way, singular, there's only one way, which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is written in accordance with the law that is written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience before God and before men. I love that he sticks that in there. Now, after years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings in which they have found me occupied in the temple, having been purified without any crowd or uproar. But there were some Jews from Asia, remember this, the Jews from Ephesus, who ought to have been present before you and to make an accusation if they have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves tell them, tell what misdeed they found when I stood before the council, other than for this one statement, which I shouted out while standing among them, for the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial before you today. Okay, so that's a big chunk. Let's break it down. Start in verse 10. Okay, so Paul, how Paul addresses the, um, the governor. He doesn't do so with flattery. He just, like, look at this self-control. Look at this confidence. They have accused Paul of some pretty serious charges, right? Now, if someone has ever um, come after you and insulted you, insulted your character, what's your first response? Like you wanna defend yourself and be like, wait a minute, I never did that. I never said that unless you trust the one who is the ultimate judge, unless you have put your faith and trust in him who is above, who rules and reigns, Paul knows that he is innocent. <laughs> Paul knows that he will stand before God because he believes in the resurrection in eternity and God will be the judge. Felix might be the one whom he is standing before right now, but who is over Felix? Who is ultimately over this trial? 
It is God. And he also knows that God has promised he will go to Rome and he will witness to Rome. Paul has this self-control to wait until it is his turn. And that self-control is, is, is a fruit of the Spirit and it is a part of, of walking in submission to Christ. It is this deep faith and trust. And it is with this fact that Paul comes before the before uh, before Felix and before these religious officials, and he states the fact. Okay, so what are the facts? Let's just take a look at this. It was less than two weeks. He says in verse eleven that it was no more than twelve days ago that Paul was in Caesarea, and that's where um, remember where Agabus came to him and said, you know, you're going to be bound, and they warned him not to go. This is twelve days, people. Okay, that's he went up to Jerusalem, and what was his purpose in going to Jerusalem? to worship. I am here to worship this God. I don't serve as a ringleader of a sect, of a cult, because look at this also. He says, he says, look, you can't prove these charges. I admit to you that um, this is in verse 14, that, that according to the way, look, this that they call a sect, I serve the God of our fathers. It's the same God, right? I believe everything written in the law that is written and that is written in the prophets, having this hope in God. So to Paul, believing all of this now means believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, whom these Pharisees and Sadducees are rejecting. So Paul says, I'm not the one serving in the sect. What all of the law and all of the prophets point to is Jesus Christ. And that is the one in whom I have put my faith and belief in. He also says, look, they have no witnesses. Where are these Jews from Asia that accused me of these things? Remember, the religious officials did not witness any of these any of these events, right? They didn't witness Paul um, bringing a a Gentile into the temple. They didn't witness Paul causing a, a disturbance. In fact, Paul says, "Look, I didn't even carry on a discussion with anyone because Paul knew that the environment was tense. He was there to worship. He was there to to." Um, to bring an offering to the Jews and he was there because God had called him to be there and so there are no witnesses and therefore they can't prove anything but like I said he said he does admit to serving in this this sect right which is is actually the Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of everything that the law and the prophets point to what is Paul's message this essential Christian doctrine what is Paul's message he preaches the resurrection from the dead. This is eternal life. This is an and the judgment to come. And so this is the message on which Paul Paul stands on. Now, why is the resurrection so offensive? You know, I was doing a little bit of research and it's interesting to me because more and more Christians do not believe in the bodily, physical resurrection of Christ. I, that's 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 unbelievable to me. I, I I didn't even realize like that's not even a question. And let me just tell you, if you don't believe in the physical bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, you're you're not a Christian. This is an essential Christian doctrine. So why is this so offensive to us? Why is the resurrection so offensive to us? The resurrection points to eternal life. The resurrection tells us that this life isn't all that there is. There is something more, which means how you live this life will affect the life to come. That's offensive to people. Whenever you tell people that, look, you can't just live your life without any consequences. You know, this whole, like, oh, it makes me crazy. This like, oh, you do you, man. Like, whatever's right for you is right for you. Whatever's right for me is right for me. There's a consequence to that, okay? You don't get to just live like that and and not have it affect it affect you and the people around you. I I I, I see this. Um, you know, there's in especially when kids text, they like to use those abbreviations, and YOLO is one of them. You only live once. YOLO. Y O L O. Okay, that's that's not even true. Like you don't. <laughs> You live eternally. You die once, folks, but you live eternally. Okay, so YOLO is not a thing. And there's a cost to living that way. There is a cost to living you only live once, all right? And so the resurrection is an essential doctrine, but know this, to preach the resurrection to those perishing 
is foolishness. They will look upon a dead Jew on the cross and say, how is that guy going to save me? How does that relate to me? It is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who believe in it and to those who trust in the resurrection of Christ, it is worth living for, it is worth sacrificing for, and it is worth dying for. Paul says this about the resurrection. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 14 through 19. He says, if Christ was not raised, if there was no resurrection, our preaching is in vain. We are false witnesses. Our faith is worthless. We are still stuck in our sins, and we of all men are to be pitied. Read that chapter. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He talks all about the, the defense of the resurrection because there were um, people coming into Corinthian, to Corinth that were, were denying the resurrection of Christ. So um, I, I just one little side note about, about Paul's message here in, in verse 16, because um, it just kind of cracks me up as he says uh, that he has always maintained this blameless conscience before God and before men. When you go back to the previous chapter, that's what got him slapped, right? But in this court, Ananias has no authority. And so it's almost as if Paul is like, well, I'm going to say it again because he can't really smack me around here, you know? I don't think he had that that kind of heart, but it just uh, it just sort of made me chuckle when I saw it. So, um, all right, so let's go on to verses 22 and 23. But Felix, having a more exact knowledge about the way, put them off. I highlighted those three words, saying, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will decide your case. And then he gave orders to the centurion for him to be kept in custody and yet have some freedom and not to prevent any of his friends from ministering to him. So Felix decides he's not really going to make a decision, okay? So he has no witnesses, so he can't really declare Paul guilty because that would have set Rome. You need to have a witness to in order to to condemn someone, and the justice system was was important in in the Roman in the Roman Empire. And so he can't make a decision. And so if he releases Paul, he's going to Paul will probably be killed by the Jews, right? At some and if he releases him without any kind of protection, and so he keeps him, but he keeps him under house arrest, and he allows for Paul's friends to be able to minister him. We're going to see this. It's kind of interesting as Paul makes his way to Rome he's going to do so on Rome's dime and with Rome's protection and so we see already here the providence of God going before Paul and making sure that his will would be done and he's going to use evil men to make sure that that happens all right so uh, like I said we see that Felix put them off there's a sense of procrastination and we're going to see that in these remaining verses Verse 24, some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, we've already talked about her, his wife who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, I'm going to pause right there because I want to, want to look at those, those three things. So we have Felix, we've already discussed his his uh, personality, that he was his former slave, that he was a very evil, cruel uh, man and his wife, who's already left her first husband, is married to this man. And, and Paul begins to witness to Felix. He talks about faith. Faith is this assurance, this trust in something. And it's not just this like, like, oh, I just believe because someone told me to believe. It's built on truth. It's a firm truth and a firm belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he talks to him about three different things. Righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come he's gonna he's preaching the gospel to Felix it's awesome now we as human beings have this legacy of neglecting these things and how does God this is so cool like how does God answer that legacy of ours he gives us the gift of Jesus Christ now let's look at these three things just a little bit more closely okay so righteousness now, immediately when we think of, oh, someone who is a righteous person, they're a good person, right? They're, they're just a morally upright person. Biblically defining righteousness, righteousness is uh, meeting God's standards, okay? That's what biblical righteousness is. When we talk about being a good person, our standards, our moral standards change with every generation, 
right? I think about even the generation I grew up in, what was accepted then and now what is being accepted now, what is what is a good person then, what is a good person now versus my mom's generation versus my grandpa's generation. Our human ideas of what is good and what is right is constantly changing, right? So how can you ever really determine if you're a good person, if the, the, the measure for it and the bar of it constantly changes. God's measure for righteousness has never and will never be changed. No matter what church organizations say change or, 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 or reinterpret, he stays the same. He stays consistent, okay? And so, so here's what truth says about righteousness. And this is all from the book of Romans, which Paul wrote. Paul talks about God's standard, okay? So this is from, from Romans 3. Paul says, writes in Romans 3, there is not one that is righteous. There's not one single one of us, saved from Christ Jesus, that meets God's standards, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3. This is Romans 6. This is the truth. It says that the wage of sin, which is the cost, the cost of sin is what? death, the cost of sin. There is a cost to this. Make no mistake about it. Satan wants us to, to believe that, that you don't have to pay for it, that, um, that, you know, you'll be the only one affected. We know that sin spreads far and wide and the cost of it is death. This is what truth says. Remember, according to God's word, that does not change. Not according to human standards. Romans 5, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the price that we could not pay. If the price was death, it would have to be a perfect death that could atone for those sins. Christ was the one who paid the debt. Oh, I love this. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, three very important words, you will be saved. That's four you will be saved. Sorry, four words. You will be saved and that there is no longer condemn, no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and you will have peace with God. This is the miracle of new life. This is the gospel and Jesus is the only way to be truly right. So this righteousness, people try to, to cover themselves with all kinds of righteousness by, by being a good person. And, and, and when you confess Jesus Christ as Lord, he covers you with his righteousness. So when it is time for your final judgment, you stand before the judge, not with your own righteousness, not with your own measure of that which is good, because it is, the Bible says that is filthy rags before the Lord. You stand covered in the righteousness of God so that God does not see you. He does not see your sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ. The Bible says that's been imputed to you, that has been given to you. Paul is, is, is preaching this righteousness to a man who stole another man's life, who has been cruel and murderous, and a man who has no oh, self-control is the next thing that Paul begins to preach. Sometimes people talk about, um, about uh, you know, being able to, to resist the flesh, like, a, you know, I'm, I'm trying to resist, you know, drinking or overeating or my pets and retail therapy, you know, all of these things that we, we, we were trying to resist in, in the power of our flesh. Resisting is very different from control, right? Self-control, we talked about this, is a fruit of the spirit, okay? So control is this power over sin. Now, you know, when you're, when you're trying to resist something, okay, like so another one of my pet sins is like cookies. Like I love cookies and I could eat a lot of cookies. And I'll be sitting here at eight o'clock at night and I'm like, I just want a cookie, right? And, and, and as I'm like, like trying to resist, try, are you with me? Like trying to resist, trying to resist the cookie. And I don't mean to make light of it because there are, there are sins that are far more difficult and far more grave, okay? But, but just for purposes of, of an example, I begin to grow weary. And I begin to break down and I'm like, maybe I'll just have half a cookie. Like maybe it's just a little cookie. Like it can't really hurt, right? And I begin to grow weary because I'm resisting in my flesh and not in the spirit. So 
We resist in the flesh and we grow weaker. But it is this self-control that Felix clearly had none of. He clearly had no righteousness of his own. He clearly had no self-control because that self-control gives us that power. And so, so what is the final thing that, uh, that Paul talks to Felix about is the judgment to come. And I'm telling you, this is something that is often missing from the gospel presentation is the judgment to come is is the fact that there is this heaven and there is a definite hell i've even heard christians say no no, no i don't believe in hell i think that that hell is 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 here on earth and and you know we're going through that right now if this was hell on earth why did jesus christ need to come and to die and to pay for our sins for for, for just the sake of example okay let's just say there is no no judgment to come Okay, let's, let's just say, so we can live YOLO. We can live, hey, you only live once, right? And here we are doing all of these things, trying to grow in righteousness, trying to grow in holiness, only to find that one day we're gonna, they're gonna stick our body in a box and we're gonna decay and that's the end, right? Okay, so if that's the truth, I just lived a pretty good life or whatever, right? There's, to me, there's, there's not much of a cost right but if you do not believe let's just let's just count the cost of that for a moment let's just say you must if you do not believe in eternal judgment you you must at least take a moment to count the cost of not believing what does it cost if you don't believe in in that which is to come okay if you if you die and and you will stand before a holy and righteous judge and if you are not in Christ Jesus, if you are not covered in his holy righteousness, you will stand before the judge bare and naked. And he will say, you are bare and naked. Your sins are all laid out before us. How, how are you going to deny that? If you are standing there completely naked, what are you going to say? Oh, no, no, surely I'm wearing something. No, you're not. And you will be condemned. He will judge swiftly and he will judge righteously and you will spend eternity in hell. That's the cost. Okay? You must count the cost. I beg you. I plead with you. Count, with the, co count the cost of living as though there is no heaven or hell. And when you preach the gospel, when you share the gospel, make sure that you tell people. That you will stand, that God is good and he is a righteous judge and he does not desire that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance in Christ Jesus. Count the cost. That's all I'm saying is count the cost because there is a price to be paid. All right, so let's look at our last last verses, the, the end of, um, because this is important. Look at verse 25. Felix became frightened. I have that highlighted too and said, go away for the present. And when I find time, I will summons you. And at that time too, he was hoping that money would be given him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. But after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus and wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Paul preaches to Felix and his wife about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. And Felix becomes frightened. You can almost put in there convicted. Felix all of a sudden begins to think, maybe Paul is right. Maybe I need to consider the eternal judgment. Maybe I need to consider there's something to what he's he's saying and here he makes a fatal mistake he puts off Jesus have you ever heard people say you know uh yeah I'd really like to you know look into religion or learn more about Jesus but but I'm just gonna wait I'm gonna wait till there's a more convenient time I'm gonna wait till I have more time maybe I'll wait till my kids are older and you know then I'll just really read the Bible and I'll just feel like I have more time for church they postpone Jesus Christ. No decision for Christ is a decision for Christ. There is no neutral ground. You are either in him and covered, 
or you are bare naked, covered with your own filthy righteousness. There's one or the other. Hell will be filled with people like Felix, people who say, I'm going to put this off. Conviction came. Let me just tell you, conviction is a gift, okay? Conviction can be difficult because sometimes it produces this, this guilt within us, right? Guilt, the Bible calls it, when it's truly guilt from God, it is this godly sorrow. And it leads to repentance and it leads to salvation, right? The guilt of this world will, will drag our spirits down and we will be downcast. And sometimes that is with that, that godly sorrow. But with, with godly sorrow, when we have sinned, we know that there is hope. We know that we can be forgiven. We know that there is grace upon grace and that God will redeem and that God will use this. And it produces change. That's how you know the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Godly sorrow produces a change and a desire for change. I think we have to remember this is that we always think, oh, well, you know, I'm a Christian and I have to like walk perfectly. God doesn't expect that of you, that you're going to walk perfectly. And I think it's an incredible testimony for unbelievers when they see how we respond when we mess up. How powerful is it when you have, let's go back to the paperclip. When you've taken a paperclip off your coworker's desk and you come back and you say, oh my gosh, I am wrecked by this silly paperclip. It was on your desk. I needed one and I took it. I just need to give it back to you. And would you just forgive me for taking your paperclip? They're going to look at you like you have a third eye, right? But you're going to stand out because of your commitment to personal holiness, to being set apart for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So oh, don't delay. Don't delay. Don't put off Christ. Don't put off a decision for Christ. Today is the day. Eternal judgment is coming. Don't live YOLO. Don't live as if you're only going to live once. You're going to live eternally. Where you live is going to make a big difference in, in the rest of your eternity. So how do you plead? Do you plead Christ's righteousness or your own righteousness? I would plead with you today to plead the righteousness of Christ. Come to know and to see that there are none that are righteous that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved to the praise of his glorious name. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Lord, you are a God of justice. And while we do not often see justice in this life, justice is coming in the next life. Help us to fix our eyes upward today and always. There is a tendency for us to look around at the charms that this world has to offer, but they are fading and perishable. So help us to look up to you but then also, Lord, as we look out, help us to preach as Paul did. Righteousness according to God's standards, self-control as a fruit of the Holy Spirit, and the judgment to come. That Christ lived, he died, and was resurrected. That we might have eternal life with him. To the praise of your glory and in your matchless name. Amen. 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 Thanks for joining me and we will see you in two weeks for Acts 25.